Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. So yeah, we're gonna be talking about animal pests in your garden. Um, earlier in the year, we did a thing about insects and uh, technically uh, insects are animals as well, but we're not gonna be covering insects today. We're gonna be covering the bigger animals. Some of these friends that you see right here in this picture, um, these are some of the ones that um, cause some big problems for gardeners sometimes. And so we're gonna try and come up with some ideas today that will help you uh, manage these animal pests so they don't destroy your garden. <clears throat> and we'll have a little bit of background at first, and then we'll talk about animal control methods, different ways uh, that you might be able to control them. And then we'll talk specifically about the most common animal pests. Um, and we'll do that each one individually. So you'll understand because they all have different character traits and different things that they do and different ways to control them. So again, um, insects are small animals. Uh, we're mostly dealing with mammals. Um, in this case, larger animals. We'll talk about that when we get into the specific ones. A big factor in affecting what kind of animals, what kind of large animals you have, is your location. And specifically, like how close are you located to animal populations? Uh, thinking like woods, are there woods nearby? For instance, behind our house, we have some woods. Um, and so animals come out of those woods. And then across the street, behind some uh, apartments, there are woods over there too. So there's lots of wooded areas you know, in the city uh, where animal populations will reside and they will come out of those places to find your garden. So um, I usually tell people if they're near heavily wooded areas at all, you can almost count on deer and raccoons coming out of the woods. So again, remembering different types of animals cause different types of damage and they like certain crops, some of them. Um, so that's why it's helpful to know background and so to, you may not see the animal, you might just see the damage and then try to figure out what it is. So it's helpful if you know some of this background. Because then if you figure out what kind of an animal problem you have, then you can decide what to do about it. What's the best way to handle this? You know, like certain kinds of fences will work for certain animals, but they won't work for other animals or other things like that. So um, you wanna implement the best control methods, um, and a lot of it is just finding out what works. There's no one good answer for everybody, for every problem. Um, so there'll be some experimentation involved. Um, I do warn people about just going to the internet. For instance, if you're having problems with deer, you could spend hours and hours and hours, you know, sifting through all kinds of different information on the internet about how to control deer. And some of it will be good and some of it will be bad. Um, just like anything else, anything you find on the internet, you want to look for good sources, um, look for university sources, because um, they, you know, have done research and they have more reliable information than just somebody telling you what they did in their backyard. Not that sometimes that can't be helpful. Sometimes you'll learn something from somebody in their backyard, and that can be really useful. All right, animal control methods. Uh, fencing is obviously one thing that people think about. Again, some animals fencing is super helpful. Um, you know, other animals, it doesn't really help. Um, and the height, so these are things to consider when you're doing, thinking about fencing is like, how tall is it gonna be? And of course that will depend on the animal. And we'll talk about that when we talk about specific animals, like the difference between deer fencing and rabbit fencing is quite a bit. Um, and also just think about temporary versus long-term fencing. Uh, people think that fencing has to be real expensive and something you hire somebody to do, put in. You can put up temporary fencing that's not very expensive. Um, you know, see if it works. Um, you can make it more permanent if you want later. But there's some ways to do temporary fencing. Um, and again, long-term, if you're paying a contractor to put in a fence for you, that's a very expensive proposition. Um, Materials, again, that will vary a lot on what, what the height is and the strength of the fencing, the material that you're using. There's different um, grades of metal mesh. You know, there's like real lightweight chicken wire like you see in this picture and there's really lightweight posts there. That's fairly inexpensive. 
but if you're getting to thicker stuff like cattle panels um, and wooden posts, that can be more expensive. Um, T posts are really useful as a temporary fence material. There's a special kind of pounding tool to pound the T posts into the ground, but you can pound them in and pull them out real easily and move them around. If you want to make a bigger fence, you can make your garden a little bit bigger. So T posts and flexible fencing are, are really useful. And then the other consideration is just aesthetics. You know, um, you know, in my backyard, we're kind of surrounded by woods, and so people don't really care what our fence looks like. But um, in some neighborhoods, your fencing might have to look a certain way. In some cases, of course, you can't do fencing in the front yard. Um, you can't put up farm type fencing in the front yard. And then there's zoning questions, you know, like can you put a fence close to your neighbor's property? How close do you get? All those kinds of things. So you want to make sure before you put up a fence that, um, especially a permanent fence, that you are aware of any kind of regulations. So just want to not get yourself in trouble. As far as types of fencing, we mentioned chicken wire. Um, sometimes called poultry netting. It's really lightweight, very affordable, comes in different sizes. But that will keep out small critters like rabbits and things, as well as um, obviously if you have chickens and you need to keep them in. Um, most people are familiar with chain link fencing. Um, it's used a lot. Um, it doesn't necessarily keep out everything because it's really easy for animals to climb over. And of course the height, generally chain link fencing isn't real tall. Like I cannot imagine the neighborhood allowing you to put up an eight foot tall chain link fence in your backyard to keep deer out. Um, so that, that could be a problem. You can also buy galvanized roll fencing, uh, which is just, you know, metal fencing that's not as thick as chain link. It's more like what you think of like farm fencing. You can buy it at Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's, places like that. And comes in big rolls like 50 feet long or 100 feet long. And there's even some rolls that are even longer than that. And they're useful. And there's all different kinds of spacing on the, the wires that those roll fencing have. Like in this picture here, you can, I don't know if you can see it very closely, but as you get closer to the ground, the wires are closer together. And that's to keep out smaller animals like rabbits that would try to crawl through. But farther up, um, rabbits don't climb fences um, so they the things can be farther apart because obviously a deer can't get through there or um, a larger animal so typically as you go up higher this kind of graduated fencing will have larger spacing at the top and closer spacing at the bottom which is really useful um, and then posts you know wooden posts you have to sink a little bit deeper and they're in a little more permanently T posts are those metal ones, and T posts have have uh, they've been modified a little bit so that some of them are true T posts that the cross section looks like a T. Some of them are more of a, what they call a U post, uh, but still it's a metal. You know they're usually green, and there's like I say a, a metal pounding device that makes it real easy because they're hard to pound in with a sledgehammer, very difficult, and uh, and there's no need to spend that kind of energy. To use a pounder, it's very easy. Almost anyone can use it. And then there is also electric fencing. Um, a lot of people worry about electric fencing because they're concerned that they might like electrocute themselves or electrocute pets or something. Um, and electric fencing is not that powerful. Um, it's enough to make an animal realize that this is not a good thing to touch, um, but it's not going to kill anybody. Nobody's going to you know, end up going to the emergency room. Uh, it just will give you an uncomfortable jolt, just like the animal. So um, then, of course, there's probably some regulations in most cities about can you use electric fencing. But for larger areas, a little more rural, if you've got space, electric fencing can be a really good answer. Sometimes. And they now have solar chargers to make it easy to set it up. All that stuff is available at places like Tractor Supply, um, probably even the NARS and you know, some of those stores. So. All right, uh, one method of controlling animals pests in your garden is to trap them. Uh, we're talking about live trapping. We're not talking about like a, a bear claw trap that slams on an animal and kills it or something. Um, 
I mean, there are some traps for like moles and things that do kill the moles. But right now we're talking about live trapping. And there is a company called Have a Heart. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Have a Heart traps are uh, well known. They work well. They come in different sizes for different kinds of animals. And it's very important once you figure out what animal is causing the problem to get the right size. So um, smaller traps for like rabbits and squirrels. And then larger traps like this one here in the picture for raccoons and uh, groundhogs, you know, will flow for them. So, and as far as um, setting them and baiting them, it takes a little bit of skill to learn how to set the trap. It's really not that complicated once you learn it. Um, I recommend going to the internet if you get to have a heart trap and it'll show you how to set that trap and it'll even recommend, make recommendations on bait. One of the very effective baits that I've had good luck with is like an apple, uh, cut in half, smeared with peanut butter. Um, also, and that works for raccoons or groundhogs. Um, but for, particularly for raccoons, if you put an ear of sweet corn in there, because that's often what raccoons are after, that's their favorite food in the world, you could put uh, sweet corn in there and maybe smear a little peanut butter on that, and that smell will attract. The big question with live trapping is what do you do with it once you've caught it? And different people have different opinions about that. Um, some people want like to destroy the animal because they just don't want to deal with it. And I'm not a huge fan of that. I hate killing animals, um, even if they're annoying. Um, but, you know, sometimes like with mice and things like that, yeah, you might want to kill them. So that's up for people to decide for themselves. But, um, if you're going to try and remove it, you have to find a place to take the animal. And what you'll soon discover is that there's not very many good places to take animals. Um, you might think that you could take them like to the nature center and drop them off, but they don't really want hundreds of raccoons every year. So um, you need to find some place where they could be removed to. The best case is if you have a friend who has private property out in the country uh, to relocate them out to a country location, private property. Um, and when you're doing um, a trap like this, you want to be very careful, especially like something like a raccoon, but you know, any wild animal. Um, if you put your fingers in there to pick up that cage, you could stand a, a really good chance of being bitten. And that could be a serious problem. So they have handles on them, so you could handle them. Even though there's handles on there, I still like to wear thick gloves when I pick up that cage. And uh, you can pick it up from, if you have two people picking it up from either end, it's safer that way because they can't get close to you. And um, you just need to learn how to release them safely. You can use a string to pull that, that little trap door up. And uh, but even that, you need a little help. So it's always worth looking at the internet. Uh, I learned a little new trick this year about using that string. It was very helpful. So, And then, of course, animal control regulations. Some people also think, oh, I could just call animal control in my city and they'll just come pick it up. But they generally don't do that. Um, you can check with your local animal control and see if they will pick up things like raccoons and squirrels, groundhogs, possums, etc. And they may, but most likely most of them don't because they would be inundated with requests. So uh, you just need to figure out if you're going to relocate, where to do that. I've also heard some people claim that relocating is really not good for animals. Um, I don't know if there's enough evidence to support that. Um, so again, do your own research on that and make your own decisions. Uh, another popular animal control method is repellents. Uh, people have, ever since people have had animals getting into their gardens, people have tried to figure out um, what could I put on my plants or what could I put on my garden to deter them, what would be a bad smell that those animals would not like so they won't come and damage my plants. Um, so if you're going to get into a animal repellent situation, there's some things you need to think about. Um, one is just, are they effective? Um, I would say up until now, there haven't been a lot of good effective animal repellents with the possible exception of uh, rabbit repellents, there's some good ones there. And uh, now they have some pretty good deer ones. In fact, this one here right here is called Deer Scram. And it's a popular one. It's, um, I've heard from people who've used it that it works really well. Um, you have to 
reapply it doesn't last forever. Um, so it's a, a grain mill type thing. This one's guaranteed to work. Um, so that's nice to hear. But um, again, if you look at the internet, you'll see home remedies, internet remedies. You can make things out of garlic, hot pepper, all kinds of stuff. And you're welcome to try all of that. Um, I would say probably you'll have better luck with a commercially prepared repellent that you know will work. Um, and you'll have to read the instructions on how long they last. Um, I mean, the better ones are rain resistant. So even if you have a rain, it won't just wash it off right away. Eventually they do wear off. So just read the instructions on how often you need to reapply. Try to avoid doing it right before a rain, of course. Um, and just follow the instructions. Lots of times there'll be different products for different animals. Again, this one is recommended for deer and rabbit, um, so that's helpful. But um, sometimes you might have a, just a repellent that's just good for deer or one that's just good for rabbits or one that's good for squirrels. I have not really heard of any really good repellents for squirrels. And so if somebody out there has had good experience with that, I would love to hear about that. What, what brand you used and how you used it. Um, so you can always email, email me if you have some great reports on how to do that for squirrels. Um, and of course, there's labor required to you know, put out the repellent. But you know if they're destroying your plants, it would be worth it. Same thing with the cost involved. You know If something is destroying your plants that you've worked so hard and you're not getting anything out of it and you can spend a little money and a little labor to um, stop that from happening, it would be worth it. So, Other animal control methods are out there and some of them may or may not be effective. These are all things that I've heard from different people work well sometimes and other people will say it doesn't work so well for them. So it depends on your individual situation and the animals and also how you implement the control. I've heard of some people just saying, I've got a really good dog in my backyard and we don't have any problems with squirrels. You know, I've had people say, I have a really good cat in my backyard and we don't have any problems with squirrels. And so again, some cats are great. Some dogs are great for that kind of thing. Other ones, they just don't worry about animals at all. And they just, you know, they, they aren't good effective deterrents. Um, there's also some people will say music playing music in the garden at night. Most of the animal damage happens at night, um, you know, but if you have playing loud music, of course that gets difficult. If you're close to neighbors, you can't play loud music at night outside your backyard all night. Um, but out in the country, some people will do that. Some people will have it set on a motion detector. Uh, motion detectors can be used to, if an animal comes near, it can turn on music. Um, also, some people have motion detectors set up lights, you know, like if an animal comes near the garden and they set off the motion detector, all of a sudden a whole bunch of lights come on. That can deter animals because they don't like the bright lights. They're concerned about what's going on. And also sprinklers. Some people have motion detectors set up on sprinklers. Um, so when the animal gets near, a sprinkler comes on and starts squirting water around. Generally, animals get confused by that and are not a big fan of that. So motion detectors, you would have to be fairly handy, but all that stuff is easily available on the internet. You can set that up and try to get that stuff going to keep the animals away. So um, yet another method of uh, controlling animals that is sometimes helpful, but it's only certain kind of animals, animals that burrow underground, thinking things like chipmunks, you can flood them out. For instance, if you have chipmunks coming out of a little hole around your patio garden or whatever, you can, if you find that hole, you can get um, a hose, a garden hose, and actually just turn it on and stick it down that hole. And, you know, the animals will pop their heads out as soon as the flood starts to reach them. And if you do that often enough, maybe two or three times a week, those animals often will decide this is not a good place to live and decide that they want to go make a house elsewhere somewhere else, hopefully farther away. Um, so that is something that can be effective. And of course, you know, some people do hunting um, with like guns in the country. Um, I'm not a big fan of guns in the city for sure. And if you're out in the country, you sure need to know what you're doing if you're hunting. 
there are strict laws about when you can hunt and what you can hunt, maybe it's a deer season, um, et cetera. But um, some people will also use like a pellet rifle to deter squirrels and things like that. Again, in the city, that is a opportunity for a disaster because you might hit something you don't want to hit. And of course there are regulations, even a pellet gun, which you're allowed to, you may not be allowed to shoot that in the city limits. So you want to be extremely careful before you do anything like that. So those are just some different things that people have tried in addition to those other methods, which I previously described. All right, let's talk about some of the common animal garden pests. And one thing you'll find out about some of these is some of them are really bad pests. And other of these are not really necessarily a bad garden pest, but they have the reputation for that. And so we'll talk about that. There are certain animals that people think, oh, that's a terrible thing to have in your garden, but it may actually be doing some good in your garden. Or at the very least, it may not be doing a lot of damage. It might be getting blamed for some other animals that are doing certain things in your garden. So rabbits um, definitely can be a problem. People often think of rabbits as like one of the worst. I actually have not had as much problem with rabbits. Um, they don't seem to eat a lot of the things that I worry about. You always hear about rabbits eating lettuce. Rabbits are not really big fans of lettuce because lettuce doesn't taste that great. Um, it's not, it's got much nutrition in it. Um, rabbits are a bigger fan of things like green beans. Um, they're a big fan of, uh, actually let's go to the rabbit page, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, green beans, they're a huge fan of that. Um, they love uh, sweet potato vines, things like that. And they'll just try different things. But I would say overall on the spectrum, rabbits are fairly easy to control uh, because they don't climb fences. Uh, at least not in my experience, they don't climb fences. Generally, you can control rabbits with a two foot tall uh, chicken wire or poultry netting fence um, that has close spacing, usually has like one inch spacing. And so baby rabbits can't get through. Chain link fence is not a good deterrent for rabbits because uh, even a, a young middle sized rabbit can squeeze through a chain link fence opening. Um, and then after a while they get too big for that, but uh, baby rabbits can definitely get inside uh, chain link fencing really easily. So anyhow, rabbits, I think, do get blamed for a lot of damage and they don't typically cause as much damage as some people might think. And repellents work really well on them. Um, there is a, a fertilizer that's uh, an organic fertilizer that's used sometimes called blood meal. It's a byproduct from uh, slaughterhouses, it's, you know, basically dried blood from the slaughterhouse. Um, it has a smell when it gets wet, uh, but people have been using it as an organic fertilizer for many years and they found that it deters rabbits. Um, sprinkle around your plants, it will act as a fertilizer. Um, if you have dogs, dogs go kind of crazy over it because they smell the, the blood when it gets wet and sometimes it's a problem for dogs but um, it can deter rabbits. But there are other rabbit repellents that work well, like that deer strand that we mentioned earlier. We also trap rabbits and relocate them. Um, baby rabbits are so much smaller, they can fit through tiny openings, as we mentioned. And again, so the favorite foods that we see for rabbits would be green beans um, and probably sweet potatoes and other greens, miscellaneous greens. Uh, lettuce, not so much actually, so they're interesting. But rabbits, again, you don't want huge rabbit populations. And as everyone knows, rabbits can multiply fast if you have uh, a pair uh, that's you know producing young, they can produce a lot of young. All right, let's talk about deer. Um, deer can be really frustrating because they are larger. And they, as I mentioned before, they're likely to be present if you have wooded areas nearby. Um, like I say, in our backyard, to the back, we have some woods. There's also a creek across the street. So lots of times they're traveling through our yard on their way to the creek to get a drink. Um, so they're always looking for water sources. You will tend to see deer uh, most likely in the evening um, if they are around. And so, um, you know, as it's starting to get dusky outside, um, you'll see them. 
there is definitely is an increased deer population in urban areas. Um, years ago, gosh, when I moved to Kansas City, we did not see deer that often. Um, see them occasionally, but now we see deer all the time. We live out there in Grandview. There's lots of deer in the wooded areas, um, so uh, they're just out there. And of course, there's no natural predators, so they are increasing. Uh, fencing is can be very effective for deer, but it has to be kind of a special deer fence. And by that, referring to tall, eight foot tall fencing. Um, and so you can put up a temporary fence um, using um, T posts and cattle panels or T posts and uh, welded wire, um, galvanized wire. Um, and so like if you make a T post and attach a wooden uh, piece of lumber to it, you can make the T post be eight feet tall. So you can attach your fencing. Uh, if you have questions about how that works sometime, you can email me and I can show you a picture of that. Um, but yeah, because the eight foot tall fence is hard. But that's the size they recommend to actually keep deer from jumping in. A four foot fence, a deer won't even think twice about. They'll just jump right over. Now the exception would be a small enclosure garden. If I have one little area in my backyard that's fairly small that I have some perennial flowers in and it's not very wide. And so because it's not very wide, the deer do not want to jump into it even though it's only four feet high. But a large area, you know, they'll just jump right over the fence and go find your garden and start punching away. Um, Electric fencing has also been shown to be effective for deer, um, but you need the, the wires to be at two different heights. One is about shin height. The other one is about shoulder height, shoulder height for the deer. Um, and then they will run into that and learn that this is not a good place to be. And so they will stay away from your garden. Um, again, the repellents can work um, within the limitations that you have to reapply them. Uh, they don't last forever. You need to get them out before the deer come. Um, deer are definitely browsers, which means they like certain things more than others. They love sweet potatoes, they love sweet potato leaves, and they love um, green bean leaves, different beans, um, but they'll eat lots of different things in the garden. Uh, not so much like tomato leaves. Tomato leaves taste terrible and has some toxic things in them. Um, uh, peppers, pepper plants, they love to eat pepper plants. Um, so deer just like to try different things. And often, like if you're planting flowers around your yard, you'll see lists in, on the internet or in books saying, oh, deer will not eat these plants, certain plants. And that's often true. Um, but I have found that sometimes deer will try a plant. They may not come back, um, but they might try munching on something. And if you put out some little baby flower plants, they might come and munch them all just to try them. And then you said, oh, I don't really like them. They won't come back and eat more, uh, but they just destroyed all your plants. So um, they don't necessarily read all the lists that um, people say of different plants they won't bother, but they will come back and eat many different types of plants, many different types of trees and shrubs, fruit trees, and of course, garden vegetable plants. So again, deer, you're gonna see them in the evening, sometimes early morning and they can be voracious eaters and uh, cause problems for your garden. Here's a little bit more about fencing. I'm sorry, I didn't really figure out ahead of second slide. So eight feet tall, strong materials are needed. I did once buy some netting that was meant to be, to keep deer out and it was pretty lightweight, kind of like um, bird netting, you put around blackberries and things like that. You know, pretty light, and I had a deer just run right through it, tear it. Wow. So the plastic netting may not be the best. <clears throat> um, so cattle panels, welded wire fencing work good. <clears throat> but some fencing will do. Um, I'll show you this picture here below. <clears throat> or actually, you can see it up above. They're starting it. They put up posts, and they've got eight foot tall posts. And then they'll put cattle panels, which is a little rigid metal panel that you just basically fasten to the fence post, very easy to do. But then above that, you can put like 
single strand of wires. You don't necessarily have to duplicate the stuff up on top, um, but you can use single strand wires or monofilament, which is kind of like fishing line, plastic stuff, and put like, looks like here there's two, you might be putting a third one, and sometimes people will put like mylar ribbon or mylar tape, that's this shiny stuff here, and they'll tie it, you know, to that wire in several places, and that lets the deer know that there's something there, and they are less likely to try and jump over it because they see there's something there and they're not sure, you know, they want to get tangled up in a bunch of wires. So they are definitely being cautious. So that can really work to uh, help keep the deer out. And that's a relatively inexpensive deer fence right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so squirrels are a huge pest um, right up there with uh, deer, you know, being one of the most, in fact, squirrels are probably the worst. Um, and I hear more questions about squirrels probably than any other thing in the garden because they have a favorite food and in the garden, and that would be tomatoes. And there's lots of urban folklore about squirrels and how to control them, and different things you can do, like say, you put down a garlic spray or a hot pepper spray. People say if you put out water, um, little dishes of water, that the only reason that squirrels like to eat tomatoes is because that gives them a source of water. Um, but there's been people who've done that, put out little pans of water, and they still come and eat the tomatoes. And of course, the really frustrating thing is squirrels will take a, a big tomato that's just starting to turn ripe, hasn't even fully ripened, and they'll take a two bites out of it, maybe three bites, and they'll just drop it and then go on. Not like they take it back with them to their nest to feed their babies or whatever. They just like to take a couple bites and drop it, maybe go look for another one. So they are truly, truly annoying. Um, and of course, in a lot of the suburb areas, people planted a lot of pin oaks, you know, 50 years ago, and they've got big pin oak trees. So we have huge squirrel populations because of all the, the oak trees that produce acorns, which squirrels love. Um, so the other thing is there's not very many natural predators. Um, you know, out in the country, there's things like foxes and coyotes that will, um, even big owls can, you know, eliminate some of the squirrel population, but not as much of that in the city. Um, so there's not very many natural predators. Dogs, again, can be a predator. Cats uh, can take on a younger squirrel. A lot of cats won't take on a full-grown squirrel. And squirrels are pretty fast, um, but if you have a, a good dog roaming your yard, there are less likely to be very many squirrels jumping around because they do not like to be chased. We talked about using repellents. I'm still looking for a really effective squirrel repellent. So if anybody has one, if they've had good luck, not just something you read about on the internet, but something you've actually used yourself, I'd be interested in hearing about that. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's trapping them with the have a heart traps. Um, but here's one method um, that um, can work, and that's fencing. Um, but it's actually more than fencing, it would be caging. So squirrels, because they jump around from tree branch to tree branch, if you just put up a four foot fence or a six foot fence or an eight foot fence, that's not going to bother squirrels at all. They are just going to either climb it or jump in from a nearby tree where they can just jump in and land. Um, squirrels are famous for that kind of stuff. They do it all the time. So you, if you're going to make a fence, like let's say a six foot tall fence, obviously you'd have to do that all the way around. Uh, you have to have a small opening so that squirrels can't squeeze through. But then you also have to put fencing over the top. But this can work. And it's, it's a little bit of work to get it set up with some cost involved, but if you can't grow tomatoes any other way, this is the solution. I had a, a, a friend years ago, an older gentleman named Henry, and he um, is no longer with us, but he had tomatoes in his backyard and he had built himself a little cage out of some two by fours just stuck in the ground and some two by fours going across. And then he attached uh, chicken wire all the way around, all the way over the top. And he made a little door to get 
himself in, in and out, so he could pick his tomatoes and water them and take care of them. And he was able to grow tomatoes. So you can do something like that. Might look a little bit like this. Uh, almost looks like a dog kennel or something like that. Uh, not impossible to build. Um, you could even move it, you know, if you didn't make it too heavy, you could move it around to a different place because you know, it's a good idea to rotate your tomato crops, you know, move, grow them in a little bit different place. Um, so it definitely um, can work really well. Um, it's just somewhat complicated to get it started. But, you know, once you get it done, you plant your tomatoes in there and that way the squirrels cannot get in. And again, look at the top. It's got the chicken wire going over the top. So you have to, has to be tall enough so you can get in there. If you don't mind stooping over a little bit. Yeah, it could be like five feet, right at six feet if you're not very tall. Um, if you're tall, you know, you just got to allow yourself enough room. If you have to stoop over a little bit. It's not the end of the world because you're not going to be in there forever. And you're going to be bending over probably to pick up your thick tomatoes and, you know, mulch and water and weed and that kind of stuff anyhow. So you're not necessarily going to be standing straight up all the time. But you, you want to have enough height so you can get in there. Um, chipmunks and ground squirrels. Um, there is some confusion on what they are. Um, they're rodents like squirrels. Um, the eastern chipmunk, the one on the right here, is the one people often think of as a chipmunk. Um, I think there's a western version of it too. I've seen that in Colorado. Um, and I don't see as many chipmunks around here. Some people have them. Lots of times what people say they have chipmunks, what they really have is what's called the ground squirrel. Similar looking animal, very small. They make little holes in the ground. Um, anyhow, so they can do burrowing. Um, I don't know if they eat a lot of vegetables. They like to eat seeds. So like sometimes if you plant seeds, like let's say you're planting some sunflower seeds or some beans or some pumpkin seeds or something, they might decide to come along and just eat them all. So um, they can be a problem with their burrows. Um, some people will trap them. Some people will put out poison. Um, if you put out poison for things like this, you gotta be very careful if you're not poisoning any pets or heaven forbid uh, children or anything like that. So. Um, there's little poison stations, just like people use for mice and rats that you can put out for them. And this is one animal that the flooding control works really well. And I've actually done this myself at a garden location once where I just stuck the garden hose in there and a bunch of crown squirrels popped their heads up and came running out. And then we did it for several days in a row. And then after that, they just went and found another place to do it. So it was not a problem. So. Um, it's not too difficult to deal with animals like this. Raccoons are a big pest uh, that I've had some experience with. In fact, just recently, um, we had some sweet corn here at the Kansas City Community Gardens that was just starting to get ready, wasn't quite ready yet. And uh, of course, raccoons start coming in and start eating it. And like squirrels, there's lots of urban folklore. And when I say that, you know, people, stories that they post online or that they just tell each other over the back fence about their experience with raccoons. People have raccoons often getting into their garages to get into their trash cans. Um, they do love vegetables. Um, and so they're definitely vegetarians, mostly. Um, favorite foods, they love corn, they love fruit. Um, I don't know if they eat tomatoes quite as much, but yeah, they do some, but sweet corn is their favorite. And if you've ever seen a sweet corn ear on your plant that looks like the one up above, it looks kind of shredded. That's where they take their claws and they peel back the, the shuck, the husk of the corn, and uh, it looks all shredded like that. That is, you can be 100% sure that that is a raccoon. Because this will happen at night. They will come visit you at night. Um, if you come out in the middle of the night with a flashlight, you might find them. I once uh, was going up to an apple tree that I had far in the back from my property and came out in the very late evening. It was dusk, dusk time, almost dark, and I saw three raccoons up in my apple tree. And so I knew I had raccoon problems. They love apples too. So um, again, there's lack of natural predators. You know, there's not like, you know, coyotes out there and other animals that would maybe eat raccoons. Um, so, uh, 
controlling them, the populations are just you know exploding. And especially uh, urban areas where people have trash cans out, or they have compost piles out, with rotten vegetables on them, uh, or people are growing sweet corn, of course, those are all going to be places where raccoon are going to show up. They are definitely nocturnal. Uh, they'll be out at night. So trapping and relocating is one of the best ways to deal with them. Um, they talk about raccoons. Uh, if you're going to relocate them, you want to relocate them at least five miles away so they can't find their way back to your garden. Uh, so yeah, definitely out in the country somewhere is a good place um, on someone else's private property that you have permission to do that with. Groundhogs um, are also a pest. Um, I've had some problems with groundhogs at my house, but also here at the community gardens. Uh, we've had a groundhog getting into our children's garden. It burrows under a shed that we have. Um, Sometimes groundhogs are called woodchucks. So if you ever hear that term, they're used interchangeably. Uh, if you're not familiar with groundhogs, they kind of look like what you would think a beaver looks like, and similar to beavers in many ways, in just you know general size and what they look like, you know. But uh, beavers have flat tails, and groundhogs do not have big flat tails. So um, favorite foods would be fruit, um, some vegetables. Um, they do love sweet potato leaves. Um, that's the thing they always seem to come after in our children's garden. We'll have some sweet potato plants and they will just chomp, chomp, chomp them away until there's just bare vines left. And it's really frustrating. Um, again, lack of natural predators. And probably the easiest way would be trapping them and relocating them. All right, let's talk about mice and rats, both of which are very unpleasant. Uh, you don't want them in your house, but you really don't want them in your garden either. Um, a lot of people think they've never had rats in their garden, um, but in the urban core, even in some rural areas, rats are present. Um, if there's other food sources for them out in the, the farm country, there are lots of grain products and rats will be present there, so of course, they will find things in your garden to eat. Um, one of the things we've seen in the past on different gardens is sweet potatoes. Uh, people dig their sweet potatoes up in September and they'll see big bites taken out of them like that. Uh, if you see the big bites like that, um, sometimes they even leave some of the skin behind, but just definitely been chomped out and it's big like that. That would be rat damage. Um, Mice, uh, much smaller. Mice actually don't do very much damage in the garden. And even rats don't, unless you have things like sweet potatoes. So mice and rats aren't going around eating a lot of leaves that I know of. Uh, but if there's any kind of seeds, they love seeds. Uh, they love, um, rats in particular love fruits and vegetables. So they'll just eat anything. So you have a compost pile and you're having problems with something tearing it out, there's a good chance that could be rats getting in there in case you have any old rot fruits and vegetables. Or that, so. uh, rat control, you can trap them. Mice, you can trap them. Um, and people do that all the time. If they have them in their house or a garage, you can do that, but also in your garden. So similar type traps would work for that. Um, also poison um, is something that works pretty well They have poison bait traps that like the mice and the rats can get, but other animals can't get. And so that's, that can work really well. The problem is with poison is you don't necessarily know for sure that you got them other than that you're not seeing the damage anymore. You're not seeing them come around. Um, the other thing that can help is sanitation. Um, if you have a compost pile and you've been having problems with rats, a lot of people recommend not putting rotten vegetables on there. Or if you are putting them on there, um, put them on there in the middle and dig out a hole and rock that stuff in there and then cover it up with dirt and compost around it so it's not easy for them to get to. Uh, but just tossing in things like that. Also, if you toss in things like eggshells, that will attract rats as well. So just be careful what you put in your compost pile. Um, bowls are a problem sometimes. And a lot of people aren't really familiar with bowls and they think it's just some 
kind of a different type of mole. Um, it's really not so much like a mole as they look kind of more like a big mouse. In fact, sometimes they're called a meadow mouse, meadow mice. Um, they're a little, little bigger, a little fluffier. That picture there makes them look a little bigger, but they're, they're definitely bigger than a mouse and smaller and friendlier looking than a rat. They look cute, almost like a little guinea pig or something. Um, they do damage to perennial roots, like if you've got different perennial crops in, um, they'll, they'll bother root crops, vegetables and stuff. They also can just tear up lawns. Sometimes people have problems with their grass in certain areas because voles are just burrowing around. Um, if you look at the picture up here on the right, you can just see some of the damage looks like. You can see all these little tunnels uh, and raised areas where they've got little burrows with the holes in the ground. You know, and just things kind of you know look like something has been digging and bur burrowing around in there. Um, so that's that's a sign. Um, so you can trap them, uh, poison. People will use some poison sometimes, drop them down the hole. The flooding can also work. There's also a repellent that actually works. And this is one of those cases where I heard about this and I thought that it was just one of those internet things where somebody said it works on the internet and then a person copied that and then another person copied that and somebody shared it with somebody else. Pretty soon it's all over the internet, but it may not really work. But um, castor oil is actually a good repellent for voles. Uh, not for other animals or other pests that I know of. I haven't heard about that in relation to them, like rats and mice. But for voles, it does appear to work. I actually did some research and saw some university research where they had um, tested, field tested using castor oil. Castor oil is the oil that comes from the castor bean. And castor oil has been used um, as a home remedy, medicinal type thing, good for what ails you, et cetera. It's kind of nasty tasting stuff, uh, you know, so it can act as a laxative, you know, you know, so obviously I'm not recommending this for people. You have to decide if you want to use castor oil as a home remedy for your own personal use. But for a repellent for bold, it does look like it's effective according to university uh, studies. So. Um, you can see some bowl damage up above here on beets, how they kind of hollowed out those beets, and also on sweet potatoes. So we saw the, the rat damage, but sometimes it's difficult to tell um, if it's rat damage or, or bowls. The thing on bowls, though, is that the eating is not quite as deep um, because their mouths are smaller, so it's more on the surface, um, that sweet potato there as opposed to like the sweet potato on the mice, uh, the rats here, see how those are a little bit deeper as they, they chew deeper into the sweet potato. But, uh, the little voles um, don't dig quite deep. Not that that's a consolation, obviously destroying the sweet potato, uh, but you can try the castor oil repellent and um, look online and give you some instructions on, on how, to, how to apply that. So. Moles, um, another plant that is, I'm no, sorry, another pest, animal pest that can be really annoying. Um, but it's kind of a revelation for some people, moles aren't really eating your plants. It's not like, you know, they're burrowing under into your garden and eating all your carrots and your root crops and things like that. They, they moles generally eat earthworms um, and grubs and things like that. So they're actually good animals for many things. Um, eating, you know, grubs like Japanese people grub and stuff. Um, but their burrows are just a problem. The problem in your garden, the problem in your, your lawn, um, you know. So um, some people will use traps. They're, they're generally a kill trap, a device that you stick into the mole bureau, a burrow, um, and like press on it with your foot and it sets the trap. And then as the mole comes through the burrow, the trap gets set off and it kills them, goes around. So, They'll have to pull it out and get rid of the dead animal. That can be unpleasant. Some people will put out poisons like poison peanuts, bury them in the ground once they find a burrow. Um, you know, that can be effective, but again, you know, you'd have to put stuff where you think no one could ever find it. You would not want pets or children to find peanuts out in the garden and think, oh, it's a little snack. Um, so don't want that to happen. Uh, repellents, there actually are some good mole repellents that are supposed to work also. Um, so 
moles are, are, can be just a, a perennial problem and they do multiply um, and they make their lawn look really terrible. But if you see, um, you know, little dirt piles like this, that would be a mole hill or they've come up, they come up sometimes, uh, you know, in the overnight time. Uh, occasionally, like you'll see a little bit of movement um, in that dirt pile, that mole hill. And you'll know that a mole might be ready to emerge. And some people have dogs, especially smaller dogs like terriers. If they see something in the soil moving just a little bit, they will go in there and they will dig it out and they'll catch that mole and kill it. So um, there are some dogs that are pretty good uh, uh, deterrents to moles because they will hunt them out and capture them. So. Birds can also be a problem, uh, but they can also be beneficial. Um, birds eat insects, you know, so that's a good thing. Uh, some birds also eat fruit, and that's a bad thing. They love berries, especially. They can also damage young transplants. I've had people like put out like you know young tomato plants, you know, pepper plants, and birds will come along and just grab that little plant and take the stalk back for actually building a nest. So that can be a problem. Um, but for berries, yeah, if you have something like blackberries or raspberries, sometimes birds can be terrible pests. Um, and even larger fruits too. Cherries, they're a real problem on. So um, what some people do is put netting over a plant and that will screen out the birds so they can't get in there. Here is an example again of cages where people put cages out to protect their fruits from birds, but also from uh, other animals, such uh, raccoons and groundhogs and stuff. So um, that's really effective to, you know, if you have some, a big raspberry planting or blackberry planting, that would make it worthwhile. And it makes it easier to try and pick them. Um, some people will use netting, uh, not quite as expensive, not as permanent. Uh, you can just put up wires and drape the netting over the top. Um, you wanna make sure you can try to seal the bottom of it. Like I like to put like a, a two by four along the bottom to help weight it down so that uh, birds can't get in underneath. Um, you want to make it tight enough so birds can't get inside, not just so they don't get your fruit, which of course is important, but also so they don't get stuck in there. Every now and then I'll hear about, or somebody will tell me about that, um, you know, birds got in under their netting and they got stuck in there and they couldn't find their way out. And it's just really annoying. So, and sometimes the birds will die from that. So that's not good. But, Bird netting is fairly inexpensive and works pretty well and is not too difficult to put up. Um, we've also used netting like this. Uh, some friends of ours put up netting like this over a young peach tree. They had a young peach tree. And what happened was the squirrels would come and eat the peaches every late summer. And so we put netting over the top of that and that kept the squirrels out. And we fastened it at the bottom. And once the peaches were all getting really ripe, they opened it up and picked all their peaches. And that was the first year they got to eat some of the peaches because the squirrels didn't get them off. So uh, netting can be really useful. I also hear a lot from people about snakes in their garden. And I think most people realize that snakes don't actually hurt the garden. They're not eating um, your plants or hurting your vegetables. In fact, snakes are pretty beneficial generally. They uh, control rodents, you know, small mice, et cetera, things like that. And most snakes aren't poisonous. Uh, of course, some people say, well, how can you tell? And so, yeah, it's helpful to learn about how to identify poisonous snakes. Uh, you go online, you can learn that from the conservation department. They have brochures that will explain all that to you. And so most snakes are not poisonous. And once you become familiar with them, uh, it's not quite as frightening, but snakes still are startling. I know for even me, I'm working in the garden and I'm you know, moving some mulch around all of a sudden and I, I see a snake, you know, it startles you because you're not expecting it. Um, they're alarming. So, um, you know, you even though you they're not poisonous, you can actually get bit if you try to pick up a black snake. Um, I know some people that that's happened to. Um, so, you know, be careful if you're trying to pick them up and relocate them, um, especially a larger snake like a black snake. Um, you wouldn't get a poisonous bite, but you might have to go get a tetanus shot or something, you know? So um, they actually do make a snake repellent. Um, and believe it or not, 
it actually does work. I've heard good results about it. It's called Dr. T's Snake Away, which is a really corny name, but it does appear to work. Uh, it's recalled that you put out. Um, the other thing that's super helpful is to keep down the grass and weeds around your garden and in your garden. If your garden's overgrown with weeds and there's tall grass and weeds growing around the outside of your garden, it's going to be really good cover for snakes. Cut your grass really short, pull the weeds out of your garden, you're not going to have near as much cover for snakes. They want cover. They do not want to go be exposed and you know, not have stuff that slithers you. They, they want to hide in the tall weeds, the tall grass. So um, it really is, that can be something that would be very helpful to keep down that vegetation. And then if you need to, you can use snake eat cover. We talked about cats and dogs being helpful to chase away some animals, but cats and dogs can also be a pest in your garden um, sometimes because dogs will dig in your garden. Cats will go out and, you know, poop in your garden. Of course, that's annoying. So um, if you need to put a fence with some chicken wire around it to keep out your dogs and cats, that's probably a good idea. And, you know, if they want to help chase away squirrels and rabbits that are outside of the garden fence, great. Uh, that way they can be more useful. So inside the garden, I've had people who literally thought they had to give up garden because their dog just kept getting in there and digging it all up and tearing out their plants. All right, let's talk about a couple other little friends here, possums and skunks. We're almost near the end here, folks. Um, possums and skunks, neither one is uh, does much damage in the vegetable garden. Uh, both of them are nocturnal. Um, you're not going to see them in the daytime, usually. Um, they also have kind of a reputation for having rabies, you know, like if you see a skunk or uh, a possum, and that isn't necessarily true. Um, it is true that if you see one of these animals in the daytime and they're acting strangely, kind of like they're sick or dizzy and they're wandering around, there is a good chance that could be a rabid animal. But um, I searched the literature and most people agree that like no one's been bitten by a skunk or a, a possum and gotten rabies in any recorded history that anybody knows of. Um, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, uh, but it appears to be extremely rare. And of course, you'd have to be getting close to them and trying to pick them up for something by hand, which is not a good idea, especially with the skunks. But so they're not a big threat as far as rabies, but you know, um, Again, I really don't want skunks around my yard. Um, I would worry about that. Uh, I don't want skunks anywhere near my house. Um, so far, I've, I've avoided that, knock on wood. Um, possums, um, they don't tear up your garden too much, but they, they do eat some rotten fruits and vegetables. So if you've got stuff that's not been picked on your plants, they might come around and bother that. Um, they generally just don't tear out plants. Um, Good thing about possums is they uh, prefer the rotten fruits and vegetables. So yeah, they might get into your compost pile. Uh, but possums also eat a lot of ticks. And I don't know about you, but I don't like ticks. And anything that eats um, a lot of ticks is good. I read somewhere that uh, possum over the summer will eat about 6,000 ticks. Um, so that could be a good thing, um, I think. So that's good. Skunks, of course, are a big problem because of the odor. If you're not familiar with how that works, they are able to, when they're threatened and they're frightened, they have glands that can emit the spray that is an extremely foul odor. Um, if you've never smelled it, I, well, most people have, because if you drive along the highway, skunk gets run over, you'll smell that. So yeah, it must be a skunk back there. But um, if you've ever had a, a, a dog or something that's gotten sprayed by a skunk, we got too close. It's a terrible thing. They smell terrible for a long time. Skunks do have some um, bright points, though. They they eat Japanese beetles, um, which are good. I mean, it's good that they eat them. Not that Japanese beetles are good, but anything that will eat some Japanese beetles can be a useful thing. I'm still not going to invite any skunks into my yard anytime soon, just because of that potential um, threat of that real bad odor. So. Um, slugs and snails, I did talk about those in my insect class, but they're not true insect. Um, they're actually a mollusk, you know, so like a shell animal, like, you know, clams, and oysters, and those kinds of things, crab, um, more closely related to that. Um, 
Damage usually happens at night. If you have something, especially in the early spring, eating lettuce plants and take big bites out of lettuce plants or whole plants, um, that's a good chance that you've got slugs or snails. Um, and a, a slug basically is just a snail without a shell. Um, upper right hand corner, you see a picture of a slug. Very slimy, um, very nasty. Um, down here is a typical snail with a little shell on the back. Um, again, very slimy. Um, they like that cool, moist weather, so you see them a lot in the spring, especially if you put mulch down a little bit too early. I do recommend mulching, but sometimes in the spring, you want to wait just a little bit so you get past the really cool rainy season um, so you don't attract a lot of uh, slugs and snails because they do like the mulch. Um, in the summer, not so much the problem, slugs and snails. If you do have them, there you can control them with iron phosphate baits. Um, that's toxic to them, but it's a relatively safe material. There are some other baits which are poisonous to people and pets, and you have to be careful if you can put those out. Um, so I don't recommend them at all. Uh, much safer to use the iron phosphate bait. One of the brand names for that is Sluggo, um, and they will get rid of slugs uh, pretty handily. Um, slugs also um, do like, they won't necessarily tear open fruit, but if a fruit's already been compromised, like a cherry tomato split open or something, they will go inside to feed on that. They really do love lettuce early in the spring. So, um, I think that might be it. Check the slides. Yep, that's it. Um, if there's any questions, uh, hopefully people have been sending questions to Rob, um, and we'll see if he has any questions for us. Nope. Uh, looks like we we're able to answer everybody's questions in the chat, so um, I don't have anything for you. That is great. Well, okay. Thank you, people, for joining us today. If you do have questions later or other garden questions, you can email them to us at contact at kccg.org. Um, we try to answer questions that people send in to us, or if you come into our office sometime. And if you've never been to our office, I recommend you come visit, especially come visit our children's garden. The Beanstalk Children's Garden is very beautiful. It's open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and Saturday mornings, 9 to 12. It's a really great garden. You can see lots of interesting plants and learn lots of interesting things. Um, Kansas City Community Garden is a membership organization. Our mission is to help low-income families and community groups and schools to grow food from gardens. Um, you can find us on the internet, kccg.org. Um, or if you just Google Kansas City Community Gardens, we're really easy to find. Lots of great information on our website about growing, and also about our membership. If you're not a low-income person or a community group, you can still join and become a member and get some great seeds and plants from us at relatively low cost. And um, always looking for supporters for Kansas City Community Gardens. There's lots of different ways you can help by volunteering your time or donating money. Um, so again, we thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.